Joey, say hi, girls. Hi, girls. Say maybe see you tomorrow. Maybe see you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Joey wanted to say hi. He is so hyper today. All right. World War One Part Two. Here we go. All right, so the U.S. is trying to stay out, but we've got all these very clear ties. Now, a lot of things are going to start to change early 1917. So Wilson's been elected to his second term, and we see a big change in what Germany is doing in their unrestricted submarine warfare. Excuse me. Starting in January of 1917, the Germans decide to abandon their Sussex Pledge and resume totally unrestricted submarine warfare. So they're not warning anybody anymore. They're not letting people get to the lifeboats. They're just opening it up. It's open season because they're starting to realize they're losing and they need to make some type of big push. And one of the pushes they know that would help is if they can cut off the flow of American supplies to the English and the French. So unrestricted submarine warfare. This is going to be something that's going to pull the U.S. in. We're going to see lots of ships sunk because of this. And then the first ship is sunk. Um... January 31st of 1917, and Wilson cuts off all diplomatic ties to Germany, and now things are starting to heat up a little bit, and it's looking like it's going to be harder for Wilson to keep his pledge to keep us out of World War I. Now, there's a few other immediate causes. One of them is the Zimmerman telegram. All right, This is a telegram to Mexico from Germany that gets intercepted by British intelligence on March 1st of 1917. All right, so here's the actual telegram itself. All right, so this is a telegram. It's in some code. The British broke the code. Pretty cool to be able to look at, all right, that we actually have this. All right, so pretty cool. All right, so here's the deal. Arthur, the German foreign minister, Arthur Zimmerman, sends it. That's why it's called the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram. And it is to Mexico. It says, all right, Mexico, here's what we want you to do. Invade the United States. They want the Mex uh, They want Mexico to do that. To keep us busy so we don't come over to Europe, all right? So Germany says, all right, Mexico, you're going to invade the United States to basically keep them busy. And then that's going to give us time to win the war back in Europe. And then you, Mexico, will get our help from Germany uh, to defeat the Americans after we defeat the Allied powers in Europe. And in return for doing this, for keeping the Americans busy for a while, either beat them on your own or eventually we'll come help. And then... In return, we will help you get Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona back. So we, you can get part of your land back from the Mexican session after the Mexican-American War, right? And after the you know fight for Texas and their uh, war for independence. So the Zimmerman telegram, Mexico, invade the United States to help us, Germany. Now, when the Americans hear about this, we're obviously upset for the American people. It really starts to convince them that we might have to go to war because Germany's basically out to get us. Something that's going to make it easier to go to war is the Russian Revolution. So the Russian Revolution gets going in March of 1917, and the Bolsheviks take charge. They oust Tsar Nicholas II, kill him and his entire family pretty crazy. Um, but now the Russians are out. They start a six-year civil war after this that's going to be absolutely wild. But Wilson didn't want to be allies with the Allied powers because Russia was ruled by the autocratic Tsar Nicholas II. Well, now the Russians are out, so we don't have to make this weird political arrangement with a non-democracy. Well, you probably heard Joey on that one. So they're out. All right, and then again, the renewed submarine attacks. First week of March, the, the Germans sink five different U.S. ships. So all of these things are coming together, right? We've got our economic ties. We've got the submarine warfare, the Lusitania, right? The Germans are starting to sink again. We've got the Zimmerman note, $2 billion in loans that we've given out. The Russians are out. So now the U.S. is going to get involved. So, oh, 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 skirt, skirt, move that up. Boom, we get our declaration of war on April 2nd, 1917. Now we've got to mobilize. Now we've got to get industry and finance working together to make sure that we can actually go win this war. So another handout that's on the topics page is this guy right here, World War I Industrial and Economic Mobilization Efforts. We start all these different boards, and we basically take over the economy. We, the government, take over the economy in almost total 
fashion. The War Industry Boards, the Food Administration, the Fuel Administration, the War Labor Board, the, the Finance Admin, uh, the Administration of Finance, all these things drastically increase the power of the government. So we see a huge flex of government muscle at this time as we start to get the supplies that we need to be able to go win this war. What was kind of nice for the progressives is that a lot of these um, boards also fulfilled some of their progressive promises, like the National War Labor Board. Wages went up, the eight-hour workday became the norm, and union membership increased, and unions became more established and more recognized and weren't, you know... Um, uh, broken up as easily. All right, so they were able to get some things done, like factories became safer at this time. Um, unemployment, of course, dropped. So the progressives were able to get a lot done in these war industry boards, but the government also increased its power and set a precedent for being able to do this, and it worked. It worked really well. Wars are won by those who have the most stuff. Right? We know that, especially from the Civil War. So the U.S. is able to use their mobilization of industry to their advantage, and it's also going to help all of our allies. All right, Public opinion and propaganda was another very important part of mobilization for World War I. So we had this guy named George Creel. George Creel was the uh, leader. He was in charge of the Committee on Public Information. And he used all kinds of stuff, posters, pamphlets, little movies, to vilify the Germans and drum up support for the war. So we'll see lots of propaganda. But unfortunately, it worked too well. It actually started to kind of um, institute like some war hysteria. We started to see some prejudice after the war, well, during the war and after. Um, and a lot of weird things happened, like sauerkraut was renamed Freedom Cabbage. The hamburger was named a Liberty Sandwich. So that way we can't be supporting anything German. But we'll also see some some immigrant backlash for this, something from Milwaukee. So um, before World War One. There were um, seven newspapers in Milwaukee, and six of them were in German because we had such a deep-rooted German community in Milwaukee. So seven newspapers, six of them are written in German, one of them is written in English. After World War One, there was only one German-language newspaper left, and that didn't last very long. I think by like 1921 or 22, it had lost um, enough subscribers that it couldn't publish anymore. So we'll see this backlash, and it's going to stick around for a long time because we got people so worked up about um, the Hun, as we called them at this time, and, and demonizing um, the Germans and their allies. So there were all kinds of posters that came out. You can take a, a pause here and look at any of them. I love this one. Here, let me just move me for a second. It's like this guy sitting here and the little girl saying, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? And he's got like the thousand yard stare and he's like, oh... Mm, I am a coward. I did nothing. And his son's like playing with little army toys. I mean, it's absolute classic play on people's masculinity to get them involved in the war. Um, buying liberty bonds, bonds and finance are going to be a big part of it. Um, don't eat meat, eat cottage cheese, so that way you can save the meat for the soldiers. Um, here's one from the Lusitania, right? Enlist, join the Navy, right? Don't let all of these sinkings continue. There's just all kinds of stuff out here. Um, they even made videos um, of that would play before movies, right? Halt the Hun, wake up America. It's our duty to go out here and help win World War I. So with all this public opinion, some of it was also really negative. We saw the Espionage Act go in in 1917, and this is a huge suppression of civil liberties. And this, again, is something that happens in times of war. We saw Lincoln suspend the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War. We're going to see civil liberties suspended in World War I, World War II. Even more recently, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, we had the Patriot Act passed, which basically says the government can spy on you now. Right, all the memes about you know your FBI guy watching you through your computer. So the Espionage Act goes in in 1917, up to 20 years imprisonment for anyone who obstructed the draft. Okay, so you can't mess with the draft um, or the war effort in any way. So this also helps with some regulation of industry, um, but it's taking away your uh, ability um, to have free exercise and free speech, um, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, excuse me. The Sedition Act of 1918 was the worst. This prohibited anyone from making disloyal or abusive remarks about the U.S. government. So you could not speak out against the government or the war effort. It basically made disagreeing with the government illegal. Oh my gosh, can you imagine, right? And this obviously, freedom of speech is gone with this. 
right? And about 2,000 people will be persecuted under this. About half of them will be jailed. One of the most famous was Eugene Debs. Remember the head of the American Socialist Party that ran for president all those times? He spoke out against the war effort, and he got sentenced to jail for 10 years. He served three, and then he was pardoned. One of the funny parts is he ran a presidential campaign from jail in 1916, which is kind of awesome. Um, but these were upheld by um, Shank versus United States in 1919. This is the famous case that says free speech can be limited when it represents a clear and public danger. Like you can't yell, say it to yourself out loud, fire in a crowded theater, right? So public speech, or excuse me, freedom of speech can be limited when it presents a clear and present danger to the public. So the government is increasing their power to limit our freedoms. The government is increasing their power to um, regulate industry. The government's even increasing their power to draft people in the army because uh, another thing we see happening at this time is the uh, Selective Service Act, right? As we're getting the armed forces ready to go, the Selective Service Act goes in in 1917, and this is when we basically just have the draft. Okay, the draft goes in with the Selective Service Act. Um, eventually, 2.8 million people will be drafted in the Selective Service Act. About another 2 million will enlist. Um, by the end, between enlistments, those who are already signed up in the Selective Service Act will have about 5 million people in the U.S. Army. About a million of those will actually get overseas and see a little bit of fighting, not that much. But even here, right now, um, the government can uh, draft you right, and increase the size of the army. So we're seeing a, a lot of expansion of government power here. Now, African Americans. Racial segregation was still the norm in the army, and it still will be in World War II, all right? We don't get rid of segregation in the army until after World War II, okay? It's going to take a long time for that to happen. It'll eventually happen by executive order, too. Congress can't even pass it. Truman's going to do it with executive order. It's like um, 4098, something like that. I wrote a paper about it in college. That's why I kind of remember it. 1098, 4098. Either way, eventually about half a million African Americans signed up to serve. Okay, they're not getting drafted in. This is all enlistment. This is all voluntary enlistment. Um, they were in segregated units. They were typically not allowed to be officers. They were banned from the Marines. And usually they were not even allowed to have their own um, African American officers. They were usually um, regiments with a white officer in charge. And a lot of times they were not allowed to see combat. They're in more of like the reserve help roles, if you will. Um, but this is something we always see. As African Americans try to fight for their freedom and equality at home, they try to earn that freedom and equality by fighting in wars. All the way back to the French and Indian War, the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, flip back a couple, the Mexican-American War, World War I, World War II, Korean War. This is something that we constantly see happening in American history. But a lot of leaders in the African-American community, like W.E.B. Du Bois, said, listen, if we can fight for democracy abroad... Maybe we can win democracy back home. This could be how we start to guarantee more equality for ourselves. So this is an opportunity. African Americans always realize that. Unfortunately, the country's history is pretty shameful in our recognition of the impact and the servitude that they had for our country. Now, some effects of mobilization. Let's just um, wrap up this part of the World War I video with the effects of mobilization. All right, everyone had to make adjustments. Everyone had to do rationing. This is something that was uh, a very normalized part of society. You only got so much of X amount of goods for rationing, so your life has to go through big time adjustments for that. People weren't wild about it, but you do it because it's for the greater good. Um, come on. Women went through some massive changes because of mobilization. One, new things are opened up for women in economics. Now, unfortunately, as women take the jobs that men left behind when the men joined the war effort, those jobs don't stay there when the men get back. But women are able to go out and gain more jobs. Women enter the workforce, a lot of women, for the first time. And it was the contributions... Um, of, uh, of women in the war effort, that's one of the things that led to the 19th Amendment. Remember, we talked about that. Women were already voting in most states around the country before World War I and before the 19th Amendment, but mobilization and women's positive impact on the war effort was very important in helping them gain the right to vote, and it just exposed women to new areas of society and economics that they weren't previously allowed to be in. 
Mexican Americans and African Americans, again, big impact here. All right, Mexican Americans and African Americans serve in the war. Mexican Americans have new jobs open to them too. This is also one of the first times in American history that we really start to see some more recording of Mexican American history. We also encouraged um, Mexicans from Mexico to cross the border and take agricultural jobs that other people left behind. And in general, there was a huge economic boom from this. The American economy was humming and doing well. Okay, pick up World War I part.